Welcome, everyone. On behalf of De Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator Paul Schultz and myself, welcome to our virtual all-hands meeting. Paul and I are pleased to be with you today and to convey to you that we believe this is a very special time for NOS, for NOAA, and for the nation. And we're here to recognize you and all that you've done to remain resilient through these challenging times. First things first, First things first, I will turn my camera on. First things first, I'd like to take a minute to make sure that everyone is able to hear me and that everyone can see the presentation. If you're having technical issues, please email robertlevy at noaa.gov. That's robert.levy at noaa.gov. And if you or we have any technical malfunctions that can't be resolved, the NOS4 employees website will have today's proceedings posted there for a later viewing. With that, let's get started. In an effort to continually improve our virtual all hands, we're mixing things up again with a slightly different format than we've been accustomed to. In my April 28th email, I, to all NOS staff, I gave you some updates on NOS leadership and budget, and I offered some highlights regarding your ongoing diversity and inclusion, training and development, and zero waste efforts. I appreciate everyone's work in support of these activities, and in honor of Public Service Recognition Week, Paul and I will be devoting a large portion of today's all hands to celebrating your accomplishments, innovation, and hard work during these uniquely challenging times. We will also share, share important information with you regarding workplace flexibilities, racial equity, and the vital role that NOAA and NOS will play in meeting the new administration's goals and priorities. Of course, we'll end with a question and answer session, so get ready for that. Now I'd like to welcome NOAA Chief of Staff, Dr. Karen Hinn, who is here to offer some opening words. Prior to joining NOAA as Chief of Staff in January of 2021, Dr. Hinn spent four years at the National Audubon Society, where she served as Vice President for Coastal Conservation, as well as Director of Water and Coastal Policy. With Karen's strong background in coastal conservation and resilience, I am looking forward to getting her into our National Marine Sanctuaries or our National Estuarian Research Reserve, maybe even go bird watching. Karen is no stranger to federal government, and in her previous roles where she championed conservation issues across the federal branch, she has been the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at the Department of Interior, Senior Advisor to NOAA, Chief of Staff to the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, and Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary of Commerce. She's also served as professional staff and NOAA Sea Grant Canal Fellow on the National Resource Committee in the House, U.S. House of Representatives. Karen received her Ph.D. in Marine Affairs at the University of Rhode Island and an M.S. and a B.S. from Stanford University, so don't even think about trying to school her. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Thanks a lot, Nicole. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks for that kind introduction, Nicole. Uh, I really want to give you a shout out also for all of your work that you've been doing, um, your dual hatting role as both the acting assistant secretary and as your role in NOS. You've been an invaluable part of the team, and it's, I'm really thankful to be able to work with you and your entire team um, who I've gotten to meet over the course of the last uh, 100 or so days. Um, and all of you here at NOS, I just want to say thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's um, a real pleasure to serve um, with such a bright and wonderful and passionate group of people. Um, as Nicole mentioned, it's Public Service Recognition Week, which is really an awesome time to recognize all federal employees um, and to sort of set aside time to honor the men and women who serve our nation at all levels of government, federal, state, county, local, government, and employees. Um, I'm honored to be working with you all at NOS and to be working as part of NOAA, where we, uh, as I think you've seen from Ben Friedman's note um, a little earlier this week, that we have three SAMUs finalists this year, which is really awesome um, across the organization. Um, and I'm just really proud to be serving alongside of you. Um, Nicole gave a little bit about my background. Um, so it's really great to be here. I just as uh, stuff that Nicole doesn't know, but I grew up in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia um, in sort of the suburbs. It was a little bit more rural then, but 
Um, so I didn't have any exposure to the ocean, and my parents sent me away to a camp in Maine when I was in fifth grade, maybe because I was a pain in the butt, or maybe because um, they thought it would be a good educational experience. So I went out there, we did like tide pooling, and went out on boats, and did a little bit of um, trying to figure out what was in the water, and so that was just my first exposure to the ocean, and I've sort of fallen in love with it ever since, and have um, even though I lived in Pennsylvania for the rest of my, you know, uh, youth, I uh, was exposed to lots of ocean work and marine policy work in the course of my education, um, and then started sort of my career that Nicole outlined um, as a Sea Grant Fellow um, on the Hill after I graduated from URI. So the ocean is, I think, you know, I'm as passionate about the ocean as all of you are. Um, and just see an incredible role that it plays. And I'm just thankful for all of the work you guys do to steward and study and understand um, such an important part and, and, you know, obviously a huge part of the world that we live in. Um, I am also really thankful to be back as part of the administration and as part of the NOAA family. It's been, at least from my standpoint, a really seamless transition. Um, you know, to me, there's really no divide between the political team and the career team in terms of pushing forward and bringing our A game to what we can do as part of a whole government effort to address climate change and equity issues across the board. Um, and NOAA and uh, the National Ocean Service play a huge role in that. Um, we are firing at all cylinders, so just thank you guys for participating in all of the work that's underway already. We've I think um, started quickly out of the gate in this first 100 days. Um, for, for me, NOS in particular plays a really incredible role in all parts of our climate and equity work, um, particularly around mitigation with the work we do in blue carbon and trying to sequester CO2 as part of a natural climate solutions approach to addressing um, CO2 and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You guys also play an incredible role in our ambition around offshore wind to make sure that we are using clean energy wherever possible, but also doing it in a responsible way. Uh, clearly, you hold the role in our adaptation work in terms of the work and the information you provide communities to, you know, envision a future for themselves in the face of really serious threats like flooding and sea level rise. And that information is critically important to help people adapt and to provide that information in an equitable way uh, to all Americans, especially those who have been, uh, who live in underserved communities. And the stewardship work you do in terms of the National Marine Sanctuaries, NEARS, all the other programs that really protect these special places, study these special places so that we can keep them um, conserved going forward. Um, obviously, we have a, we're standing up a big effort around 30 by 30, so the goal to um, conserve lands and waters, 30% of lands and waters by 2030, and we're really thankful for everybody's work and contribution to that effort, really emphasizing, you know, the unique way that we as a country conserve these lands, work with partners to do so, um, lift up uh, a way to conserve places that are um, led by local you know, local desire and a conservation benefit that will be durable and last throughout the years. Um, and then we are standing up sort of a, a um, civilian climate core, which was not only uh, a way to build the next generation of a workforce that can be trained up on climate solutions like restoration activities and conservation activities across the board. Um, but also helps us build our own workforce um, in terms of the skill sets we need going into the future. And across that is the layer of racial equity where we, um, we need to make sure that the services that we provide in the face of climate change to communities serves all communities, um, and that is a really important um, priority of this administration. So NOS and NOAA are critical to combating climate change, working on economic development and recovery, supporting these equity priorities, obviously supporting scientific integrity, which is also another priority, and conserving the coastal ocean and Great Lakes places and resources that we rely on. Um, I'm realizing as Chief of Staff that I, um, I am really thankful to be working with all of you and 
really realize that I am time limited in the, my ability to understand all the great work you do. So apologize if it feels like we're slow and up and running, but we are really excited and I've had the opportunity to participate in a lot of meet and learn a lot more about a lot of the work that you guys do. Some of those things include um, recently I participated in the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee with our partners at DOI and in the state of Alaska. Um, that's a forum to um, collaborate between federal and state partners on mapping activities in Alaska, and that was really interesting to learn how we support that effort and lead, especially in the coastal resilience side of the work in Alaska, which serves as the front lines in a lot of ways to uh, the issues we're seeing around coastal resilience. I've been learning from a lot of you about the important tools and data that are provided by NOS that include really neat things like the Oceans Report Tool and Digital Coast and the National Spatial Reference System. Um, and I've been learning across NOAA how we support and facilitate offshore wind industry both through NOS and, and NIMS um, so that we can push forward on this goal to increase renewable energy and um, conserve these places that are really important. So I am just, um, and in addition also there are um, obviously the programs that we hold near and dear to our heart here at NOAA, which includes sanctuaries and the research reserves. So I'm just very thankful to be learning a lot with you. Appreciate your patience as we all get up to speed and build out our team um, and engage uh, as part of the whole government effort to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, and do so in a way that serves all of, um, all of the American public. So thank you for the opportunity to serve with you all. Um, thank you for teaching us a lot along the way. We really appreciate it. Um, and I just look forward to continuing this effort over the course of the next few years. So thanks a lot, and I'll turn it back to Nicole. and strange is going on. So I'm going to start uh, talking. Oh, OK, awesome. Um, thank you, Karen, uh, so much for providing us with that message and spending the time with us today, as you can tell. Karen is learning a lot about NOS programs, and I really appreciate her engagement um, on all of those and advocacy already. Um, I pr also really echo your remarks, Karen, about how meaningful it is to work at NOS, uh, at NOAA, and I am so grateful for the work that NOS does. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you and the rest of the team as they onboard. Uh, we don't have many on the team yet, but I can assure everyone at NOS that they are all very skilled and are fighting for NOS and for NOAA as much as they possibly can. Um, as many of you may have heard, uh, Dr. Rick Spinrad has been nominated to serve as the NOAA Administrator. So we may be having a new member of the team come on very soon. Dr. Spinrad is not new to NOAA. He has served uh, formerly as the NOSAA, the OARAA, and as NOAA's chief scientist. Rick has also been a steady and supportive mentor of mine for the last several years, so I am very grateful uh, for his nomination and looking forward to having him on board once he is confirmed uh, by the Senate. At this time, I would like to turn the, Paul over, the floor over to Paul to share some special highlights from around the agency. Paul? I'm going to share and celebrate some program, program office highlights. But more than that, I want to take the time and recognize all the ways the offices have gone above and beyond to overcome the obstacles of the last year. The way we've adapted and responded to the stresses of the pandemic is an accomplishment in and of itself. And what I had to do, because we had so many accomplishments, um, was cull them down quite a lot to be able to fit them into the time allotted. So, um, I'm going to be covering them in all five of these areas <clears throat> and, and hopefully give kind of a balanced perspective across all of NOS. So first off, the National Marine Sanctuary 
system oversaw the expansion of Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary, resulting in tripling their size. So that was a huge accomplishment. Co-ops actually launched two new operational forecast models along the West Coast and the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and ORNR reported settlements totaling $47.3 million for restoration projects at sites near Santa Barbara, California, and along the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. In addition, um, we had some legislative accomplishments with the Save Our Seas 2.0 Act and Digital Coast Act both being signed into law supporting major NOS programs. In the area of expanded partnerships, the Coral Reef Conservation Program is working closely with Force Blue at the nonprofit that partners special operations veteran divers with coral conservation projects. NCOS has continued its partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as on nature-based infrastructure projects. And I used to participating in the sum, this summer uh, 2021 Google Summer of Code, which is mentoring student coders during a 10-week project using real data. That should be exciting to see what the results are of that. Stay away from my computer. Uh, in the area of safe on-site work, we have, we've had a lot of things going on. Starting out, though, with NCOS, um, NCOS implemented exhaustive COVID-19 prevention protocols for their C4 sampling crews last year in 2020 and a recent essential fish habitat mapping cruise. Pre-cruise protocols included quarantine and COVID testing, and while on board, precautions included reduced occupancy, social distancing, and masks. Now, this next one is one that really we share across all of our IT staff. IMO and the NOS IT staff um, have been working remotely, just as all of us have, and they've and on site, but they've provided continuous support with what I understand has been as close to 100% uptime as we can have. And they managed to deploy and maintain laptops to the new staff as well as um, getting old and roll out software updates. So that's been a huge set of things given uh, all of us have been remote and distributed. OCF actually replanned their entire 2020 field season to assign work within the newly established COVID-19 protocol and increase use of uncrewed vessels. They were able to survey 6,129 square nautical miles and rescheme 359 electronic navigational charts despite the constraints of pandemic considerations. OCM managed to welcome the first cohort of Margaret A. Davidson, Davidson Fellows, one for each of the 29 National Estuarine Research Reserves. So in the, in the area of increased virtual opportunities, um, we've, had, we've had quite a few successes as well, and I want to highlight three of them. OCM had a 35% increase in participation when their coastal management training program went fully virtual because they couldn't do in-person training. The National Geodetic Survey has hosted virtual convocations the last two years, and just this week they are hosting a virtual summit for geospatial professionals. And so far this fiscal year, the Office of National Marine Sanctuary webinar series has hosted 32 distant learning events that drew over 21,000 registrants. So in the area of supporting team camaraderie, we've had a lot of things going on. We've actually been pulling out the stops on creativity across all of NOS. Several offices, including co-ops and NGS, have been having virtual brown bag sessions where staff are sharing product updates, scientific advancements, and historical information in some cases. ORNR has held 101s allowing new staff members to learn about the office, meet leadership, and bond with other new employees. NGS encouraged the use of creative Google backgrounds during meetings or attending meetings while on a walk or sitting outside. And many of our offices have kind of given people permission to turn off their camera during meetings because virtual meetings can be so intense. In addition, met, most offices have had held virtual happy hours or informal show, social gatherings as a way of staying connected. 
all of these adaptions, large and small, serious and lighthearted, have helped us over this challenging year. Back to you, Nicole. All right. Thank you, Paul. It's really inspiring to hear all of the innovative ways that you've been able to keep up morale under these uh, circumstances and in these unprecedented times while also achieving amazing accomplishments across the program. I know there are a lot of challenges out there. And now I want to switch gears and talk about more than the challenges that we face in this moment. I want to talk about the opportunities that this moment offers in OS and NOAA and our nation, as I see them not only from my role as acting in OS system administrator, but also as I work across the NOAA line offices with the NOAA policy team to support the ongoing transition. Straddling these various roles, I can state confidently that based upon my, need, my meetings, briefings, discussions, and congressional hearings in which I've participated, that this is truly a unique moment for NOAA. Already within this administration, NOAA's role has been spotlighted in a way that it never before has through executive orders, presidential memoranda, White House announcements, among other things. I'm not exaggerating when I say that NOAA and NOS will very likely play a once-in-a-generation pivotal role in carrying out the initiatives and goals critical to meeting administration priorities. For many of you, this notion is not new because you've been enabling NOS to step in the spotlight, not only because of decades of solid work, but by more recently responding to numerous requests for information and task force on budget, policy, science, skill engagement, you name it. Because of your responsiveness and expertise, NOS is center stage when it comes to carrying out the administration's top priorities. And this administration's priorities have been very clear. They closely align with our mission, what we are most capable of doing, and what we most want for ourselves, our partners, and our workforce. Some of these priorities include addressing climate change, conserving our lands and waters, dealing with racial and environmental injustices, meaningful tribal engagement, scientific integrity, economic jobs, economic recovery and jobs recovery, clean energy, such as through offshore wind development, and climate resilient infrastructure. Each of these top priorities should sound familiar. We've heard many of them from Karen, and they're on the news lately. But also, they should be familiar to you because they are already found throughout our mission statements, strategic planning documents, and year-after-year year budget requests. These aren't just new priorities for NOS. This is what we do. What is new, however, is the attention that we're receiving the scale of the work being considered, and the strength of our voices at the table, helping to make NOS and NOAA priorities a reality for everyone. Both the policy team at NOAA and in my role at the helm of NOS and in working with the NOAA policy team, we've been participating in high-level meetings with other federal agencies and partners, and they are looking to NOS and to NOAA to advance this administration's goals, and NOAA is answering the call. Sure, this attention to our expertise has resulted in increased energy and positive momentum and a focus surrounding what we do. But with that increased focus comes increased demand for our time, our energy, and our resources. I fully recognize that we're going to be stretched further than we have been in the past. And that, by being stretched, I mean not just stretched to reach higher goals, but also stretched thin. We already are. I know that I am but I am confident that release is around the corner. In the meantime, yes, some of us are tired. Probably a lot of us are feeling tired from dealing with the pandemic, with racial inequities, with civil unrest, with kids at home, with being asked to continue to do our stellar work that we love but was already hard enough. I urge you to continue doing whatever you need to do to remain resilient, including keeping up the kinds of examples that Paul just shared and reach out and seek help and support where your resilience has not perhaps held up against the restraint, the strains around you. I know how hard it is to stay focused and strong. Resilience isn't an action or one thing we do. It's a state of being. And remaining resilient takes a lot of work in and of itself. Still, 
it is essential that we continue to take care of ourselves and step into this unique moment, moving from the pandemic into the spotlight. It can feel a bit like whiplash, and it is essential that we feel and that we are ready for this moment. NOS is uniquely poised to deliver in this moment because we have been working for decades or more on the things that are today administration priorities. We are world leaders in generating and delivering environmental data, including climate impact information and predictions in service of the American people. Through timely delivery of trusted information and climate services, we save lives, protect property, and increase community resilience. By authority and by design, NOS is unique among federal agencies in that we study and monitor, but we also predict, forecast, conserve, train, deliver, and we listen. We are ready to execute this administration's priorities because we are so, they are so well aligned with our expertise and our core values. I believe that we are ready and that we are fighting to ensure that we have the resources needed to step up not just into the spotlight, but so that NOS has what it needs to lead, convene, and serve as a trusted advisor for other federal agencies and for our partners as our planet changes at an accelerated pace. This is your moment. This is our moment. And don't just ask my word for it or take my word for it. You can ask Congress. NOAA's leading role in helping our nation adapt to climate change was apparent on April 15th, just a few weeks ago, when Dr. Steve Volz and I, Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Prediction, and the NESIS Assistant Administrator, had the distinct honor of testifying before the House Commerce Science and Justice Appropriations Subcommittee. This was a historic moment for NOAA. Dr. Volz and I were the only two witnesses, both from a single federal agency, which is quite unusual. This was the first time that NOAA was singled out as a climate service provider to the nation at such a high-profile event. Requesting that we testify in this manner shows that Congress not only recognizes the huge role that the ocean plays in affecting climate change, but that NOAA is a leader in responding to climate change. At the hearing, Dr. Volz and I not only demonstrated a, or conveyed what NOAA can do, but what NOAA already does to measure and predict climate change and its impact. We underscored the fact that NOAA's observational records, including NOS's, go back centuries in some cases. Helped, these records helped fuel our nation's growth and prosperity. We emphasized to Congress how NOAA's science and services benefit the nation's infrastructure as well as natural ecosystems that protect lives, property, and our economy against the impacts of climate change. That we offer climate services for everyday Americans is important, but we also conveyed that there is so much more to do, more of what NOAA and NOS is well qualified to do in tackling the climate crisis. We I testified that the ocean is a major driver of regional climate variability, increasing the frequency and severity of extreme events such as droughts, floods, and hurricanes. We impressed upon Congress that climate change is already impacting the ocean environment resulting in ocean warming, rising sea levels, and ocean acidification impacting vulnerable communities and causing the disruption of marine ecosystems. We said to Congress that no one needs Congress's support to continue to build and improve upon the services that we provide to inform and prepare our nation and communities for the challenge of climate change. That's a lot of things that we said, and there was a lot more left unsaid, of course. Fortunately, I'll bet that there will be more climate hearings around the corner, so stay tuned and know that we may have just entered an era of NOAA's influence as never seen before as Americans adapt to our changing climate. And now I'd like to offer a brief look at the key priorities of this administration where NOS is most likely to have a great role in its expertise and services. First, climate change. Climate change is a global problem, posing an existential threat from national security to local economy. As I indicated before, NOAA and NOS is well poised to assist in administration priorities to combat climate change at home and abroad. NOS's modeling and predictive climate capabilities, as one example, are critical to remaining resilient to climate change, and our role in this field will only increase as time goes on. 
next. As a part of this administration's climate resilience strategy is the goal to conserve at least 30% of our lands and waters by the year 2030. For decades, NOS has connected people to places through our national marine sanctuaries and our national estuarine research reserves. Place-based conservation, as we well know at NOS, cultivates the next generation of environmental stewards and scientists and conserves areas important to health and well-being of communities. As a leading agency charged with the protection of our nation's ocean and Great Lakes waters, NOAA is already playing a significant role in advancing this administration effort. And NOAA is seeking stakeholder engagement and input to help define conservation goals and targets, identify gaps in marine resource and habitat conservation, identify ways to improve the management of existing marine protected areas, and to promote an open and inclusive public process, leaning heavily on our existing place-based conservation program. Next, racial justice. We are also dealing with the compounding and continuing impacts of racial inequity and environmental injustices. Of course, these inequities and injustices are not new, but they have been revealed in such a sustained way that mainstream America is more aware of them now than we have been in the recent past. Several executive orders have solidified the U.S. government's commitment to make environmental justice a priority. As a part of this, I've been asked to represent the Department of Commerce on a White House-led interagency council on environmental justice. I am honored to serve on the council across the DOC bureaus to represent this important effort. And I know that environmental justice is something that we at NOS take very seriously, so it was a natural fit for me to volunteer for this role. Across NOS, our work to provide information that supports science-based decision-making for all Americans is more important than ever. For example, we're expanding the scope of grant requests to include diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations. We are also working to create more education and fellowship opportunities for minorities and at minority-serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities. We're engaging underrepresented communities and students in marine conservation and stewardship through many grants. And in the year 2020, NOS announced com competitive grant awards for tribes, territories, and other underserved populations. Which brings me to the next administration priority, strengthening tribal consultations and nation-to-nation -nation relationships, wherein we will do more to respect tribal sovereignty and self-governance, commit to fulfilling federal trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations, and conduct regular and meaningful and robust consultations with tribal nations. We at NOS have come to deeply value tribal input and engagement in our efforts, and we will continue to build upon them as we provide actionable data and services to all communities, including territorial, tribal, and indigenous populations. Next, when we provide these data and services to all Americans, we will do so with the utmost scientific integrity. A recent Scientific Integrity Memorandum released by the new administration requires scientific agencies to coordinate with a new Scientific Integrity Task Force to ensure, among other things, that scientific integrity policies are consistent with scientific principles. NOAA is a leader across the federal government as far as already being in compliance with this memorandum, but still, we are conducting reviews to determine if NOAA should take any additional steps. Being empowered to conduct our science without interference and release our data without suppression is something I think we can all get behind. Next, economic recovery, infrastructure, and jobs. NOAA and NOS can also play a role, along with the Department of Commerce, to help rebuild the economy. NOAA programs already provide foundational information that help to stabilize our economy directly by supporting shipping, fishing, recreation, and tourism all major contributors to our way of life. And because our nation's economy and well-being is disproportionately reliant on coastal industries and infrastructure, we must remain laser focused on stabilization of these sectors and on preparing our nation to adapt to inundation and sea level rise. Next, offshore wind development. Another way that NOS, along with NOAA Fisheries, can help strengthen our economy is through the facilitation of offshore wind energy development. This administration is calling for doubling offshore wind by the year 2030. 
NOS brings invaluable expertise in the siting of wind farms, minimizing conflict between wind and other ocean users, and in assessing wind energy, in, wind, sorry, wind energy impact on the marine environment. In March, NOAA announced a memorandum of agreement with Orsted, an offshore wind development company, for the sharing of data and efforts spearheaded by our very own NOS staff. The NOA, MOA is the first of its kind between an offshore wind developer and NOAA, paving the way for similar data sharing agreements with other developers. In fact, I'm working across the NOAA line offices to determine if this collaborative work can be replicated more broadly. Next, the decade of ocean science. This administration's emphasis on international leadership was showcased at the recent White House Climate Leaders Summit. And we anticipate the United States' active involvement in the UN Decade of Ocean Science. A few years back, the United Nations proclaimed a Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development to be held from the years 2021 to 2030. The decade will hold a virtual launch event on June 1st. This cross-disciplinary collaborative international endeavor aims to improve ocean health while creating better conditions for the sustainable development of our oceans and coasts throughout the world. The Ocean Decade is an opportunity to bring visibility to our work, establish new connections, and broaden our impact. NOS, NOAA, and other federal agencies, and many more across the United States are already participating in the decade. In fact, NOS has made significant contributions to a suite of NOAA proposals and to the overall design of this initiative. Stay tuned for updates on the decade as it progresses. And thank you to everyone who is representing NOS on these important efforts. Now, let's talk about returning to work in the office. Not to work, but in the office. I know that many of you are eager to get a better sense of what returning to the office will look like. I am right there with you. Paul is going to talk with you more in just a moment about workplace flexibilities and the work he's doing to make sure we continue to put people's health and safety first. As conditions improve and as the number of new COVID cases decrease, like other agencies, NOAA will initiate a safe return to on-site work. At this time, however, there is no specific timeline for this phased return, and it will most likely vary by location. As throughout the pandemic, please speak with your supervisor if you have any questions or health or safety concerns related to your working conditions and responsibilities. And please visit the COVID-19 Information and Resources section of the NOS for Employees website for more information about phased return. And now I'm going to turn the virtual floor over to Paul to provide some updates on how NOAA leadership is moving forward on the SSMC Workplace Consolidation Project, analyzing new workplace flexibility policy and developing racial equity initiatives. Paul? Thank you, Nicole. I think I managed to get my mic on this time. So <clears throat> I want to talk about this um, three different areas, racial equity, workplace flexibilities, and then the SSMC or Silver Spring uh, Metro Campus Consolidation Plan. As it relates to racial equity, just wanted to make sure everybody understood that there is a, a high level um, group that's been established, advisory group, um, led by Latisse LaFaire, one of the political uh, policy team members. I'm on it. Every line office and staff office has um, a member on it. We have intimately been involved in shaping what's happened with the FY22 budget, which does include some projects and activities as it relates to racial equity. In addition, there will be some things kind of unfolding in the next month or two that are going to be happening uh, this summer. And there have been three different programs that were picked to have equity assessments done on them, which is a look at how the product or service or activity has been uh, applied to communities, underrepresented populations or communities um, that are disadvantaged and uh, doing a full-blown assessment on how to enhance or, or improve it to make it more um, equitable in terms of how it's being treated. I want to talk to you a little bit about my own personal philosophy, the whole concept of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And at the, the NEDAC retreat, which happened last week or the week before, um, I challenged the NEDAC, and I actually want to challenge NOS. 
because what I'd like to challenge you with and about is how do we do things that make diversity, inclusion, and equity part of what we do, not something extra that we do. We, we need to address these issues. There's, there's many different ways and things, but I want to challenge everybody to be thinking about that question. How can we focus on addressing the, the equity issues that exist within NOAA and within our partner communities, et cetera, and make it a part, a routine part of what we're doing. So appreciate that. Workplace flexibility is a couple of weeks ago I included a high level summary of kind of the five areas. The, the NOAA executive panel, which is the deputy assistant administrators and all the staff office directors, has established a work group on workplace flexibilities. I've, I've been on that. We've been, we were established in January and we've been working on a wide range of things. And as much as I'd like to say that we have all the answers, we do not. Um, we have been working. There's a lot of policy changes that we have to do. We do have at the highest level of the agency a commitment to saying that our starting point for consideration of flexibilities is not the pre-COVID state. It's probably not exactly where we are right now either. We do have whole functions and activities that are not as efficient or effective um, done in this posture, but, but we're doing it for the safety and health of our workforce. So it's probably somewhere in between. So we are working to maximize those flexibilities. Some of the things that um, having an evacuation order in place allow us to do don't normally exist. And you will note on the timing issue that the current evacuation order does not have an end date. So I don't, my crystal ball is no clearer than Nicole's in terms of telling us exactly when we're going to start entering into different um, transitions that the different locations will have. Um, but I can assure you that we have, and if you listen to Secretary Romano's remarks, we aren't going to force anyone to come back in the office that doesn't feel safe, and we aren't going to force anyone to telework full time. So there's a lot of in between there. There is policy and guidance that's being worked. I expect that we're going to have this stuff, the, the policy guidance, timing, activities, everything um, rolling out by early summer. So I expect that um, we'll have this information. The bottom line is, though, that every position in NOAA, every single one, will be assessed and evaluated. Um, we have to make sure that we're being consistent and that all of them are being applied. I do also want to mention that there, there are existing policies and practices that are already in place for some things. And, and hopefully, by now, any of you that had special requirements for a desk or a monitor or a chair or whatever, that you've already talked to your supervisor and your payroll manager. Um, but, and that's going to continue. We don't have, you know, if you have a unique situation and have, need some form of reasonable accommodation, that process already exists. So I want to encourage you, whether it's because you need a special setup, a unique type of desk, you have a specialized chair, whatever, um, you, you, you know, you should feel free to use those activities and those services that we have. And as we move forward with these flexibilities and they start unfolding realistically probably late this summer or into the fall, um, I would encourage you, again, as Nicole said, to talk to your supervisor about the kinds of issues and things that you're dealing with because they should be able to, to help you and, and address some of those issues. So let's talk about the Silver Spring Metro Campus, Center Campus, and the consolidation. So this has been an interesting project, let's just call it. This has been working with GSA, and GSA, because the lease is through them and all the arrangements are through them, has to manage this, and they have only wanted to do one part or phase, depending on what flavor you get. They'd only wanted to do the planning for one at a time. Well, as you may or may not know, they haven't even begun the first phase yet, and that was supposed to begin last summer. So what that means for us is I do know that we have a lot of offices that in the long run are going to be impacted. They're going to have to be consolidated. There is a lot of interest in what's going to happen with, with our office, where are we going to be in the end, what's the we don't know those answers because some of these things around workplace flexibilities are going to change some of those answers, A. And B, we've only been recently tasking the team to do the plan for the next phase or the next part of this project. 
when they haven't started the first part of this project. So while the purpose of doing this is to improve the overall workspace, provide additional technical capabilities to the staff, improve the flexible work areas we have, drop-in work zones, uh, collaboration space, et cetera. Um, we don't know exactly how that's going to shake out. And I would encourage you for the latest updates on the status of the project, because they are flowing, flowing a little more consistently, to visit the project's Google site. And you'll find a link for that on the NOS employees homepage. This is a very dynamic project. And as we've been talking about from the beginning, not only are the timelines subject to change, but much of it is subject to change. And so with that, back to you, Nicole. All right, thank you, Paul. I sincerely appreciate uh, your commitment to the workforce amidst all of the changes in this dynamic workplace and workforce landscape. It's hard to keep up with all the changes. And so, um, Paul, thank you for your earnest attempt to take care of our folks all the way through. Um, I want to conclude uh, today's all hands by emphasizing that I really, truly believe that our work has never been more valued or more needed by our nation. And I believe we are ready to contribute to the administration's priorities and goals in a really big way. I can't underscore enough how it feels to me that we are in a unique moment. And I am thrilled and honored to be able to work across the program offices, the line offices, the department, as well as the federal government, academia, and the private sector to advance this administration's priorities for a more sustainable, equitable, resilient, climate-ready nation. Thank you all for your resilience, adaptive spirit, and your dedication to NOS's mission and the well-being of its people, including yourself. You or someone you know has very likely been impacted personally or professionally by the profound struggles and uncertainties that have affected our lives since last winter. If you need help or know anyone that does, please reach out to your supervisor or consider using many of the resources available to you through NOAA's offices and capital services. Although each of us have faced individual and unique impacts, we are all very much in this together. And there is hope for a brighter future. I can see us coming out of the pandemic and into the spotlight. So stay strong, keep doing what you're doing, and steady as we go. All right, now we have a few minutes left for some questions and answers. Um, as you are um, writing all your questions in the chat box and submitting them, we're going to start with questions we receive from program offices in advance. Um, so please get those chat box or so th those comments and questions into the chat box. It's just been opened for you. Um, your questions will be uh, selected from some of our uh, behind the scenes team for answering. Okay, the first question we're going to start with is. Uh, can you uh, highlight the outcomes of the Coastal Resilience Visioning Workshop uh, that was held in March of 2021 and speak to your long-range uh, vision for the Ocean Service as it contributes to coastal resilience? Uh, so coastal resilience is something we've been doing at NOS for quite a while. Um, but the more recent efforts have been spinning up. Uh, the March 2021 workshop led by Mark Osler, our Senior Advisor for Coastal Inundation and Resilience, on visioning and coastal resilience refreshed important conversations across NOS and helped us become more aware of what questions and challenges we're facing today. Um, one outcome of the workshop was convening a team of coastal resilience subject matter experts spanning all NOS program offices. The NOS Coastal Resilience Brain Trust met for the first time on Friday, April 23rd, and will continue to convene biweekly meetings and be a focal point for NOS on coordination on emerging coastal resilience priorities. It's great to hear. Um, a second highlight of the workshop is a clear desire to refresh a shared statement of NOS's role in coastal resilience. One of the uh, early tasks for the Brain Trust is to produce that vision statement. Um, so looking ahead, I anticipate that NOS and NOAA as a whole will receive increased resources to deliver a range of climate and coastal resilience information beyond what we provide today. It's important that we are integrating our previous and current efforts with those anticipated for FY22, our goals for 23 and beyond. And um, as we execute our coastal resilience work, we see this as a 
truly and deeply greater integrate those activities across NOAA. Uh, Mark Osler is leading discussions also with uh, Paul and others across the NOS leadership team to co coordinate the technical and business uh, operational and financial components that will be required to conduct that joint planning and integration. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. From my point of view, NOS has been preparing for this coastal resilience moment for a long time. While we might have wished for widespread preparations for climate change, and uh, especially along our coast, to have begun sooner, uh, that widespread uh, adaptation seems to be beginning now. So NOS and NOAA are being asked to jump in with both feet, I guess all four feet, NOS and NOAA, uh, with our data and expertise and services. Um, and so I look forward to being able to rise to that challenge. As I said to Congress a few weeks ago when it comes to adapting to climate change, it's go time. So here we go, NOS. All right, um, let's see. The next question. How have the new political appointee students been settling into NOAA, and are there any insights on the status of other positions? Well, you've now met Dr. Karen Hinn, our chief of staff. Um, also on boarded already is Emily McAuliffe, Walker Smith, and uh, Latif Lafier, as Paul mentioned earlier. They all bring such amazing skills and expertise to their roles. Um, it's pretty incredible, and how hard they're working is impressive. But I will say, perhaps most importantly, they bring a deep love and respect for NOAA, its mission, and its people. So that's a great starting point for all of us. Um, and as I did mention earlier, Dr. Rick Finrad has been nominated as the NOAA Administrator. We're hoping he'll be confirmed soon. And that's all I can really say about the policy team and the onboarding of the new team members. Uh, but stay tuned. There will be more to come. Um, now I'm going to turn it to Paul to answer a question we received about returning to the workplace. Paul? Thank you, Nicole. So the question was, what steps can employees take to prepare for the uncertain but upcoming return to working at NOAA facilities? I would say first that you should start with thinking about your own personal and family situation. What's your, what are your constraints or issues relative to whether you have children, you're taking care of, you have elder care issues, or you have others, and start there. The next step really is talking to your supervisor about any of those, any of those um, concerns you may have or issues that are evolving. The interesting thing about what's happened during COVID is it's really blurred the lines between work and family. And so there is a lot more discussion about what's going on um, with people in their home lives. And, and you start, you have to start talking about what those issues might be as we, as we have this uncertain timeline and we don't really know exactly what's happening. Those would be my best, my best starting point recommendations. Back to you, Nicole. There's a question in the chat, Paul, that I'd like to see if you have an answer to. Um, is, the question is, given that NOAA is driven by science, are there specific metrics that NOAA is using to determine reopening, um, such as the extended community vaccination and community spread? Well, so. Yes, um, and you have listed some of those that are being considered. I will simply say that the department is taking an active role in kind of reevaluating and evaluating what reintegration may mean and defining um, not things, not in terms of phases, but in terms of steps because they want to kind of differentiate themselves from the past administration. But the two that you mentioned are two of the things that have been discussed as you go through this. Others, um, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion. It, we are expecting the department to have and roll out sometime in the June timeframe what what the phasing and the tasking exactly will be. But they are all of us have been talking a lot about about it being driven by science, numbers of cases in an area, whether or not the actual caseload is increasing, um, all of those kind of metrics, as well as potentially extensive community vaccination. But that's a touchy subject, as you well know, um, because it's a very personal issue as to whether someone. Um, feels they want to get and it's safe to get a vaccination or not. Um, so more to come on that that will be unfolding and, and communicated. I'll be sharing it as soon as we have it, as soon as we have the, the released information. Thank you. Yeah, all right, thanks. Um, we have a question um, from Ben Haskell um, wanting to know 
Um, oh, let's see. Wanting to know uh, what a doubling of wind energy by 2030 means um, in numbers of uh, turbines or energy production. So Ben, this answer crossed my inbox um, a few days ago. It is in uh, energy production. I don't have the number off the top of my head, um, but we can get back to you on that. Um, it's it's in like megawatts and big watts and that kind of thing. So I don't remember. I did see it the other day, but I don't have it off the top of my head. But it's a great question. But it is in terms of energy production. So thank you for that. Um, there was a question um, from Paula Whitfield about transcripts available from the, the Climate Services Testimony to uh, Appropriations Committee. It looks like we put those in the chat or a link to that in the chat box. Um, there is uh, access to not only the video of the hearing, um, but also our written testimony up there if you want, if you want that. Um, let's see. There is uh, also a question about the work that I've been doing downtown, right? So downtown is, is my home, just like for many of you. Um, but I have been uh, working uh, with very closely with the NOAA policy team um, to help identify where NOAA, and in some cases the Department of Commerce, um, but mostly NOAA can contribute to the administration's priorities. Um, and we talked, you know, I, I mentioned those today. I mentioned a lot of places where NOS can plug in. And so many of you have been incredibly responsive where I just need a, a subject matter expert on a very quick turnaround um, to write a one-pager or to answer some questions or to educate me so that I can advocate uh, for NOS programs, and that's that's taking actually a lot of time. Um, I'm also serving as the acting chair of the NOAA Ocean and Coastal Council, or the NOCC, um, and so I am uh, organizing around uh, the La Crosse Line Office efforts on the Blue Economy Strategic Plan. Um, we have just um, decided that we're going to create um, a group to track the UN Decade on Ocean Science through the NOCC, as well as to coordinate across the line offices Align offices on wind energy development related issues. So this is just a taste of some of the things um, that I'm doing um, downtown, right? Um, hey, I'm glad to not have to make that commute. That's for darn sure. All right, let's see. Um, any other questions for us? Oh, this is a great question from uh, Simeon Han. Let's see. Uh, Simeon asks, how will or can NOAA measure funding and resource distribution across the country to ensure that it is distributed equitably? Will there be any em special emphasis on highly impacted areas from historically underserved populations? So um, the how, I don't know yet. That there will be a special emphasis on vulnerable communities and equitable, equitable distribution, I can say yes to. Um, NOS and across NOAA have um, uh, really highlighted our ability to uh, assess and, um, and address vulnerability, not just in ecosystems, but in communities, of course, those sometimes go hand in hand, um, to uh, historically underserved populations, but also to areas where we see to be more vulnerable to climate impacts. Um, so we're looking uh, very closely at those across NOAA, how we can better integrate those and enhance them. Um, and hopefully, as I said before, hopefully we'll see more resources um, for those activities. So I can't give you the how because I don't know all the hows yet, the particulars, but I can say that um, almost every NOS line off, uh, program office is interested in contributing to that. So really looking forward to getting more work done there. And thank you for all your work um, in environmental justice. All right. Um, Crescent Mogling wants to thank me for my leadership. Thank you for yours. Um, and asking if I will be staying on as, as AA or acting in the new administration. Um, I'll be here as long as they'll let me be here. <laughs> um, they, no one's chased me off yet. So uh, with fingers crossed, we'll be able to, um, uh, I'll be able to stay at the helm and um, keep doing the work that I've been doing for about four years now. But um, thank you for asking. It's a great, it is a great question. Okay. Hey, Paul, do you want a travel question? Sort of. Eberry Knockbar wants to. Are we going to keep sure. rolling with the question? Eberry Knockbar wants to know if we're going to consider offering carbon offsets for travel by federal employees. 
Uh, there has been no discussion of that to date. That's, That's all I can say okay. about that one. But, you know, the consideration of new ideas um, to help uh, tackle the climate crisis are always always on the table. So, could you bubble that one up? Well, it's one of the things that has been discussed within the workplace flexibilities as you consider the reduction in our footprint as a result, potentially, of an increased telework, et cetera. Okay. Well, we're at time. Um, I really appreciate everyone's participation on this very auspicious day, the fourth day of May. I will not say why it's auspicious, but it is. Um, and I hope that you all are hanging in there and doing um, well. Um, thank you for joining Paul and I today. Um, Paul, do you want to say any last words? No. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye.